So um, next, please join me in welcoming Dr. John Finke, who is a biochemist and assistant professor in our division, and he's going to be speaking on improving Alzheimer's drug delivery to the brain. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, so I've been here for a few years, and what I'm gonna be telling you about today <clears throat> is work that's been done here at UWT in biomedical sciences. Um, so I've been waiting for this major to come along to codify uh, the work that I've been doing. I mean, I, it's nice that it's under environmental science, it's great, um, but uh, you know, I mean, it'd be nice to also uh, call, it, call it for what it really is, which is, which is biomedical sciences. Um, oh, something got popped up. So um, looking here, uh, my, my, my research here is about um, uh, looking at methods to improve uh, delivery of drugs into what's called, through the, into the brain. And this is a very, very hard problem. Now maybe some of you, uh, looking over here, recognize the scene that is portrayed before you. Um, and uh, those of you who are maybe literarily inclined or historically inclined will recognize this as the Great Wall of Troy. And uh, this was a wall that was considered to be impenetrable by conventional military forces of the day. Uh, and uh, the, the only way that the, uh, that the Agamemnon and his crew were able to, uh, to take down the city of Troy was to build this giant horse, which for some reason the Trojans decided this would be a great idea to bring into their, into their great city uh, as a sign of victory. Um, and we all know what happens after that, the, you know, everybody, Odysseus and you know, uh, Achilles broke out of the horse and, and sacked the city and took back their uh, Helen. So, um, so although I don't want to make that analogy too close to what we're trying to do with your brain, um, I, I do want to kind of use this analogy that sometimes we need to trick the body and trick the brain to do things that, it sh that are medically uh, beneficial to it, okay? So even though the, we, there might be barriers in our body that are very hard to get through, if we can somehow learn how those barriers work and to learn where those secret passageways might be to get us in or possibly prevent things from getting out, we can actually effect uh, positive change uh, health-wise. Okay, so um, I want to first just briefly talk about Alzheimer's disease. Most of us know about Alzheimer's disease. We, know, we, we maybe even um, are beginning to know more people than others in the past about you know, people who have Alzheimer's disease. And this is not a sensation that you are, are feeling. There are more people that you know who have Alzheimer's disease now than, than people did in the past. Okay, and, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, Alzheimer's disease, as many of you might already know, is a memory disease in that um, it primarily affects your ability for recall, although it does affect other parts of the brain as well. So one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease is that you have a shrinking of the brain, in particular the certain areas that are associated with memory and language are particularly uh, reduced, okay? So the, the um, hippocampus down here and areas of the cortex are, are reduced and that's part, in part why you see um, individuals with Alzheimer's have a lot of problems with memory and also with speaking. Now the true actual definition of Alzheimer's disease is not that you can't remember. There's actually a number of other dementias that can cause this to happen. The true hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is actually if you were to go into those regions where you, where you actually have the brain shrinking abnormally and stain them, you st there's a certain stain that will, that will identify these things called plaques made out of a protein called beta amyloid. And that is actually, it's, a, it's always done post-mortem. And this is the actual hallmark, um, the definition of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so if you, you know, um, some people volunteer to have this particular um, uh, post-mortem examination of them done um, in order to know whether they really had Alzheimer's or whether it was something else. <clears throat> okay, why is this important? Well, um, I can tell you here in a fairly short amount of time, um, what is being shown to you here is a kind of a circle, circular pill that increases in size. And that size is reflective proportionally to the number of people who will be getting Alzheimer's disease starting around 2000 and 2050. And the number is estimated to approximately triple or maybe even quadruple. Now, is this uh, something that David Hirschberg should go out and investigate as to some sort of virus that's causing Alzheimer's disease in our population? No. 
Um, in fact, it's, if anything, it's going down slightly. The main reason why more people are getting Alzheimer's disease is because we are eliminating other sources of death. <laughs> We are getting too, we are a victim of our own, our own success in a way. We have eliminated other ways that we die. And so Alzheimer's disease um, is basically affecting those who are reaching a ripe old age. So living longer does have benefits, but one of the costs is going to be dementia, unless we figure out a way to fix it. So you'll notice that the 85 plus section of the pie is the one that is growing to the greatest degree. Okay, so there's a lot of things to worry about in this world. Alzheimer's disease, global warming, is my kid gonna pass his spelling test? I, I mean, these questions are above my pay grade. But I can put the, the importance of this issue in terms of medical costs, okay? So right now, Alzheimer's disease relative to a number of other chronic conditions is somewhere around 12%. Of our, of our healthcare budget. And that's, that's not small potatoes. That's a pretty good chunk for one disease. However, in 2050, when those demographics change, it's going to be one trillion people in, uh, dollars annually instead of 200,000, and that's going to be probably more than one out of every three US healthcare dollars, okay? So this is almost, almost one of those problems where it's almost, you don't even want to think about it. So, um, uh, but it is coming and it is something we're gonna have to deal with. We gotta find ways to deal with this. And there's, you know, um, there's a lot of health kind of care approaches to this, but one of the other approaches is drugs. Okay, Alzheimer's drugs. Um, again, not the best news here. Um, there are a total of five FDA approved drugs for Alzheimer's disease. Of those five, none of them stop the disease. Um, they're only symptomatic or palliative in that they only just manage the symptoms. They don't actually slow the disease down at all. If you look at kind of the success rates out of the 500 drugs that have been tested since 2002, there's only been one that's been approved, and it's one of the drugs that is listed up here in the, in the, in the group of five. That's a 99.8% uh, failure rate. And you pair that to cancer, which is like 80% failure rate, 81% failure rate. Um, that's pretty bad. And it really, what it really does is it shows you the difficulty of addressing this particular condition. Now, a popular target that a lot of these drugs are going after is the stuff that I talked about earlier, these plaques that are forming in the brain, or at least the protein that produces these plaques. Now, there's some debate about whether that's the best strategy, but that is our first kind of big uh, biomarker that we want to attack to try to see if we can reduce the symptoms. Okay, and a popular way that we attack that particular um, uh, tar drug target is with antibodies. Now, antibody immunotherapy has been, pretty po has been popularized now um, for a number of indications like autoimmune disease and cancer, and it is the type of drug that is being used to, to address Alzheimer's disease predominantly. Not all drugs do this, but a lot of them do. And any, the nice thing about antibodies is that they're, they, unlike a lot of drugs, they are very good about going after the thing that they're supposed to go after. And this is very important when it comes to drugs. So they have these little clampers on them that go after just one very specific thing. So if there's a target, they'll land on that target, and only that target, or pretty much only that target. And when enough of them cluster around that target, they bring in the body's own natural immune system to destroy that thing. Now here's the problem with antibodies. They're big, they're proteins, and they don't have any, any real way to get to where they're supposed to go into the brain. Now for some indications, this isn't a big problem, but for Alzheimer's, the brain is where all the action is, and that's where you need them to go. In a best case scenario, you might have a drug like L-DOPA that's used for Parkinson's disease, and that's 5%, which doesn't sound very good, but for brain drugs, this is great. This is like, like a major success. The current reality for, for antibodies is actually 0.1%. So out of every antibody that they put into you to test you for Alzheimer's disease, one in a thousand is actually ending up where it's supposed to be. So it doesn't, doesn't look so good. 
However, there's a little bit of room for optimism here. A recent study in Nature has talked about a, a new antibody drug, I, Educanumab. I'm sure you've heard about it. <laughs> um, and it actually has been shown to reduce the beta amyloid load in the brain, and more importantly, halt the decline in symptoms of, um, in a dose-dependent manner of people who have Alzheimer's disease. Now, this is just a phase one trial. It needs to be backed up, needs to be repeated. Um, but the thing that I found interesting about this study is the fact that if you also look at how much gets into the brain, it's not 0.1%, it's 1.3%, okay? 13 times more than your regular old antibody. And that suggests that the blood brain, getting things into the brain may be the key to success. How do we get something to go where it doesn't want to go? As a, as a purchaser of used cars, I'm well aware of this, of this issue. Uh, and no, we're not going to inject anyone with miniature inflatable gorillas. That's not, that's not the solution. Okay, so there's, but we can learn something about the used car lot sales tactics. And there's two strategies to get customers onto the lot and get them to buy a car. The first thing is you can in increase the flow in to the car lot using various uh, tools at your disposal, or you can somehow block the exit and keep them in the car lot <laughs> until they buy a car. <laughs> Maybe some of you are familiar with one or both of these tactics. So increase flow in, reduce flow out. So our question we want to ask is can sugars improve antibody delivery to the brain? And we're going to take a lesson from viruses. Anybody, anybody know what this one is? Look familiar? D David's not here. I could, I could ask him. He might. He'd probably know. So this is um, HIV. And HIV is um, when it is treated in your body, so when you're actually on the, on the antivirals, it, it needs to hide. It needs a place where those viral antivirals can't go. And it's chosen your brain as one of the places to go. And it hangs out there and waits for your immune system to go down before it can reemerge when you're old. So we don't, want it, we don't want HIV to go in your brain, but maybe we can learn something from this virus about how to get our drugs into the brain. And so we're interested in these sugar groups up here. In particular, we're, we're interested in this one called sialic acid. HIV has a number of them. This is the one that we, for a number of reasons, we're interested in. All right. So I'm just going to go straight to the results. Instead of talking to you about a lot of different experiments, if you're interested, I can tell you how we do these experiments. But we have our antibody. And we have a model of the blood-brain barrier with the cells that, that make up that blood-brain barrier. We have our antibody. It doesn't get into the brain very well normally. Let's see what happens when we put on a sugar. No effect. Shucks. <laughs> hey, you know, that's it. Talk's over. <laughs> no, no, wait. There was another way to, to get antibodies in the brain. And that was not so much that you encouraged them to come in, but once they got in there, maybe you could trap them. Okay, so getting out, they actually get out moderately fast. There's actually a, a transporter that actually kind of pumps them out at some rate. So let's see what happens when we put the sialic acid on there. Okay, it actually is shut down. Okay, so it appears that this particular sugar does a good job of keeping it from getting out of the brain, not so much getting in. But here's the thing that I think is most interesting about this experiment that we found out. The sialic acid, when we make this protein conjugate, only 20% of the antibodies actually have the sialic acid on them. So what that means is that it shuts down the whole antibody export system. It's unclear exactly how it does this, but what it looks like is that a small minority population can tell all the other drugs to stay in the brain too. 
And so now we're talking about something that could potentially, maybe we don't even need an antibody. Maybe we need something that mimics this antibody and keeps any antibody drug in the brain, not just the one we're playing with here. So future directions here. Um, aha. That's the Anna Amyloid. There's, a, there's the guy who's kind of sweet talking you at the, at the car dealership, keeping you there until you buy something, buy that truck, take it off the lot. Um, Future directions are find out why sialic acid shuts down the C-flux and also to possibly design non-antibody molecules that have the same effect. Okay, so um, I'd like to definitely acknowledge um, the support for this project, which is from the National Institutes of Health. Um, also, I have a student here who's supported by the, M the Murdoch Charitable Trust um, and also University of Washington and UWT for a lot of support in both startup and the Royalty Research Fund. Uh, here's a big list of people. I won't go over everybody who's on this list, um, but I would definitely like to thank my collaborator at the VA, uh, Dr. Bill Banks, and his team for helping us out with some of these experiments. Um, also, even though it didn't fund this research per se, um, Carl and Jan Fisher for a donation of some instrumentation that will really help propel this research forward. So with that, I thank you, and um, thanks for hearing me out.